Yeah, uh, welcome here to Seismic Radio, to um, BPN Radio. Let me see whether I can uh, get this going. Yeah, so you can see there's a little movement on the on the slide on the page. Um, this is um, um, a continuation of uh, a talk I did on Romans chapter 16, and. Um, one of the things which, which are in Romans chapter 16 is uh, that there are a lot of names and a lot of greetings Paul is sending in this letter, and, and it's pretty much meaningless. We don't know who these people are if you just read um, the book or the letter to the Romans. And even though um, it did make a lot of sense at the time the letter was written, uh, looking back in history, it's it's a little bit of a problem. So I try to do a little bit of research and find out who are these people in Romans 16. You know what, in what's behind the name. You know, do we know anything about them? And uh, and it makes uh, a lot more sense. So a lot of them, there's actually quite a um, a bit of knowledge um, available, and this is through church history and uh, through the so-called church fathers. Where we've got some information. Some of them, the um, the knowledge is very limited, so we do, we don't we don't really know. Yeah, uh, there's one or two we don't know. So that I think it's about, if my memory serves me right, about 27 who are in Rome. Paul knew them obviously, and they somehow ended up in Rome. Paul is in Corinth, and um, <clears throat> and and then there are about uh, seven eight people who are. In uh, Corinth, or in, in somewhere around about Corinth, in like Phoebe in uh, Centria, and um, uh, and again we we uh, know a little bit about some of the people, but it will be interesting to uh, to get a little bit more of an idea of what they are. So let's delve right into it. You're listening to uh, Seismic Radio to BPN Radio. My name is Michael, and uh, it's a privilege to have you here. Online. I'm going to try to, it's quite a lot of slides I've got. Um, what I'm going to do is, and this is a plan, I need to, need to get a watch here. J just let me get a watch. Um. I'm going to try to talk for, let me just go back to the microphone so you can hear me better. I'm going to try to talk for about an hour. And uh, if I'm not done, I'll split it up into two parts, into two sections, this talk. There's quite a lot of names, but it, it might be interesting as well. Especially if you like Romans, if you like the letter to the Romans, and um, you, you want to know what it's all about, and also the people this letter is going to, and know a little bit about them. There are quite, quite a lot of people, very interesting people as well. So we've got pretty much everything there. We've got slaves, we've got uh, uh, rich people, poor people, people... We are just like Paul, we've got Jews, we've got Gentiles, everything is there. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. There are 35 names, and uh, <laughs> we're going to look at the 35 names. The first name is Phoebe, and uh, she is, uh, Romans talks about her, she's a servant of the Lord, and she's from Centria near Corinth. Now, uh, this is a picture of Centria near Corinth. Uh, there used to be a harbor there, and probably a lot of goods which went into Corinth, they went via Centria. Uh, Paul says that she has been a helper of many and of Paul as well, so she said Paul. The suggestion is made that she was actually quite a rich lady and rather a wealthy lady, and um, and and also some scholars believe that she delivered the letter to Rome herself, and that's the reason why Paul was saying, you know, if she needs anything, give it to her. You know, she's a trusted and uh, and a good lady, and she lives, lives as at the port. Maybe she was in trading. Maybe she was uh, making her wealth through. Uh, port operations and um, and dealing in in goods, and now she is just using her wealth to look after the Lord's people and make sure that they are okay. She was making sure that she was going to be looked after. Paul was making sure that she was going to be looked after because she has looked after other people and she's worthy of being looked after. So that is Phoebe. Phoebe, possibly the letter carrier to Rome, and. Um, and she has been remembered for eternity in in this letter. Okay, next one. A uh, couple of it's another picture of the. You can see this here. You can look out, and and uh, we don't know how old these stones are. Problem you've got in Greece is that there are a lot of earthquakes and a lot of buildings that were erected in the first century would have been uh, gone down. So you can see down here. This is a picture of Greece. Uh, I think this is Corinth here on this map, and there's Athens. Athens, Athens, 
And then you can see as well, so on a, on a closer map, that, that you've got the port city here and Corinth is over there. Yeah. So um, that's where she's from. Okay, the next one, the next two people are Priscilla and Aquila. They're helpers in Christ. Yeah. Like Paul, they were tent makers. We see this from elsewhere in, uh, in the Bible. And they've been mentioned in the New Testament several times. So we've got Acts 18 in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. So they've been mentioned and there's uh, a representation of what they might have looked like. So uh, there's a couple. And it's interesting as well, the couple is praised as being helpers in Christ. And how nice it is when, um, when um, you know, a couple, husband and wife, when they join together and they join for the work of the Lord, and um, and they are um, they are all into it. Now, interesting as well. So Paul would have known them. Um, he has never been to Rome at this point in time, so um, the text suggests that they are in Rome already. Now, uh, what we have to understand in the first century is that. Um, a lot of uh, people had to escape um, when, if they were persecuted as Christians. And, and Rome was a very metropolitan area. It's a bit like anything goes in Rome. They had like people from nations all over the Roman Empire. Also, there was something called the Pax Romana, and I'm not sure whether it kicked in during um, the first century, uh, which basically uh, you know, meant that there was no war inside the Roman Empire. The wars were outside the Roman Empire. And you had a fairly peaceful uh, and, and prosperous existence uh, around the rim of the Mediterranean. Um, and, and that had the gospel to, to spread. We, we see this in a minute as well when we look at uh, where some of the other people in this list of the 35 names, yeah, where, uh, where those people ended up and, and where, they, where they were all going. Um, there is a list, and it says here, Aquila is listed as one of the 70 disciples sent out. So in Luke, Jesus sent out 70 disciples, or 72 disciples, I think it was. And, um, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. And, um, and in the Orthodox Church, there is a list of the 70 disciples. Uh, it's not in the Bible, it's, it's outside the Bible. So I had a look at this list, and, and there were a lot of names in there which didn't add up, because at the time of, um, you know, when Jesus was doing his work in, in Israel, um, they weren't Christians and it's unlikely that they were there. But but somehow they produced this list and this list has been floating around since uh, uh, the second, third century. And a lot of people were placed on this list. Some of them, um, I think, logistically, it would not have been possible for them to be on this list. So I, I don't take it too serious. But you, you hear this quite a few times. So they are... Uh, the, the minimum I can say they are distinguished people, otherwise the Orthodox Church would not have latched onto it and would have not have uh, placed this, these people on the list of the 70. Okay, now in AD 49, um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla got expelled from Rome and they went to Corinth and later to Ephesus. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure when this letter was written, uh, but they, they were kicked out of Rome. Um, they did instruct a disciple called Apollos, and Apollos was mentioned in 1 Corinthians, uh, so that is known about them. Um, and we've got a couple of scriptures, Acts 18, 1 Corinthians 16, and 2 Timothy 4, where, where both of them were mentioned. So Paul obviously had a quite a close relationship with them uh, so that they appear and reappear in his life again and again. Uh, both were Jewish Christians. Um, I think there was a time when all the Jews were expelled from Rome, and this might have, uh, what, what, what might have happened to them. So they were Jewish Christians. Um, and th there's a tradition which uh, suggests that both were martyred together. So Priscilla and Aquila would have to pay with their lives for their faith. Uh, and that is not quite unusual in the first century. So a lot of big names you hear in the Bible, um, I think there's almost like a 70% chance that all the names you find in the, in the New Testament, that they were martyred at some stage, obviously at some stage in their life, but, um, but down the line. So... Um, and it's quite interesting as well. So if you become a Christian, and uh, it talks about bishops as well, or church leaders, they were f primarily after church leaders. Um, if somebody made you a church leader, they pretty much gave you a death sentence. Uh, that was the first century. It's not like today when you become like a, a bishop or something, you get a nice house, you get a good income, you get a lot of esteem, uh, you're recognized by um, by the de denomination where, where you are, a bishop. And... Um, and that certainly wasn't the case in the first century. Become a bishop and uh, you may as well just uh, sign your death warrant there and then. 
because sooner or later there's a very good chance that you get martyred. The fourth per person mentioned in the list in Romans chapter 16, you know, in the greetings was Epinetus. And he got saved in Achaia or Asia. And they, they reckon that some versions say Achaia, some versions say Asia. And they think it's a spelling mistake. No, Achaia is in Greece. Asia obviously is in, in Asia. It says here that it was Paul's first convert in Asia. Uh, he was originally from Ephesus, which is, again, is Turkey, so that would be uh, in Asia. Um, he later became the bishop of uh, Karhagi. Karhagi is in North Africa. I think it's today Algeria or Tunisia, I'm not sure. But um, it's the northern coast of the Mediterranean. And again, there were a lot of Christians, and he became a bishop. Yeah. So Epinetus, bishop, uh, bishop of Karhagi. His name is translated, it means praiseworthy. So Epinetus, praiseworthy, praiseworthy man. And um, there was also an ins inscription found in Rome, and, and the problem is um, that, that some of the names which I mentioned here were quite common. I'm not sure about Epinetus, but there was an inscription somewhere, and uh, it said Epinetus and Ephesian. So not sure what happened to him, whether he was uh, martyred or not, whether he went back to Rome and probably uh, maybe found his, his martyrdom in Rome. Um, we don't know. Yeah? So there's a lot of it. Is, uh, it's a mystery. Uh, again, there's this magic list of the 70 disciples. I should maybe put it in here, but uh, I, I don't believe that this list is correct. Uh, so I, I thought I better leave it out. But but they reckon that Epinetus was one of the um, the um, the 70 disciples in um, in uh, in the gospel according to Luke. You know, the, the ones Jesus has sent out. Now, Epinetus is not necessarily a Jewish name. It sounds more Latin. So it's I, I think it's highly unlikely that, that he was there when Jesus sent the 70 disciples out. But maybe it's just a list of honor, you know, which uh, which was created later on and it was just sort of brought into conjunction with the event in Luke. But uh, again, I, I'm not sure. I have to maybe dig in a little bit deeper. Mary. Okay, we've got, this is the fifth person in... Um, in Romans 16, and this is Mary, and uh, bestowed much labor on Paul and his company. So Mary was obviously a person who did a lot of work for uh, for Paul. I, I sort of got reminded the story with Martha and Mary, where Mary listened to Jesus and Martha was just running around doing the household, and she got a bit upset with uh, uh, with Martha, with with Mary, saying, "You know, I'm doing all this work, and she's not doing anything. This is not right." Um, <clears throat> reminds me a little bit of that, but she, she, there was a woman and she was just, by the sounds of it, running around making sure that Paul is okay and that, that his company is okay as well. And again, bearing in mind, she's in Rome right now and uh, somehow she made it to Rome. Um, Paul has not been to Rome, but Paul knows her and uh, obviously she knows Paul as well and she's been of great help to him. There were suggestions that it was Mary, the mother of John, or Mary Magdalene. We don't know. No idea. Yeah. You know. There are many traditions, but uh, the person really is unknown. All we know is that it was a lady who was with Paul, did a lot of stuff for Paul and his company, and is now in Rome. So a good lady cared for Paul and his company, and their works have not been forgotten, but immortalized through the, the epistle to the Romans. Again, I, I put a little, little picture up here, which is a typical Roman household, you know, where um, it's quite interesting as well, sort of the way they did this. So they had um, like a little pool in the middle of the yard, which creates a bit of a microclimate. As it gets really hot, the water evaporates and it cools the whole thing down here, providing that it's not windy. And normally the courtyard is surrounded by, um, by walls, making sure that the wind wouldn't blow the, the nice cool air away. So uh, that was like a Mediterranean home. Uh, we've got two more uh, people. So we've got Andronicus and Junius. Um, so Andronicus means men of, men of victory. Junius, there was some um, controversy of whether um, Junia or Junius is female or male. We don't know. Both of them were kinsmen, relatives of Paul. They were Jewish Christians. And then we find out they were fellow prisoners. Yeah. You know? fellow prisoners with Paul. So somehow they got uh, caught up. 
There is, and we find, find out this uh, a little bit later, there are a couple of names which suggest that Paul was actually related to Herod. And we don't know whether it's true, but there's, uh, there are a lot of suggestions. And I, I read, you know, and whilst I was researching for this, uh, one scholar, and he was making an argument that, that Paul was actually related to Herod the Great, that he was uh, related to the grandson of Herod the Great somehow. And... Um, and again, you know, that when he got into custody that and people tried to kill him, that there was a big ooha and they protected him and they normally wouldn't do this with a prisoner uh, of just an ordinary prisoner or just a Roman citizen. But uh, there was there was more behind it and, and there's a strong suggestion that he might be quite noble, you know, of noble birth, you know, being related to the aristocracy. Aristocracy. Anyway, there were Jewish, Jewish Christians, there were fellow prisoners, there were also apostles. Um, there were notable people, so people knew about them and um, they, they were mentioned. It says here that they were in Christ before Paul, so they became Christians prior to Paul becoming a Christian. And, and they shared the same vision as Paul had, and that was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So they went away from reaching out to the, uh, the lost children of Israel or the lost sheep of Israel, and they, uh, they like Paul, you know, reached out to the Gentiles. So that's the information I found about those two. And that is number six and seven. Number eight, uh, somebody called Amplias. And it says here, beloved in the Lord. The name means spacious. Uh, it was a common slave name. Uh, he was a convert of Paul. So again, Paul knew him, Amplias. Somehow he ended up in Rome. The letter obviously went, found its way to Rome and uh, was there. And, and Rome was pretty much the place to be. There were, was a lot going on in Rome, um, and um, um, pretty much the hub of the whole empire, and a lot of people there as well. So, um, so he ended up in Rome. They found something interesting, um, and, and maybe um, there is a link with that. There's, his name was found in the catacombs, and this is a picture of uh, where the grave was in the catacombs, quite spacious not just a little hole in the wall. And um, the tomb found belonged to Flavia Domitilla. And this was Caesar Domitian's niece, so Flavia Domitilla. And there was a statement in there that um, that um, Amplius, the, the statement was made and it said, Amplius, teacher of Flavia and a friend of Paul. So... Um, we find, you know, some references later in the Bible as well where Paul talks about, you know, the, the brothers and sisters of the household of Caesar. So we know that they were Christians right up to, you know, within inches of the throne. And um, and there's a good suggestion that this Amplius was actually the teacher of Flavia and he was a friend of Paul. And we don't know, you know, time because Amplia might have been uh, just a slave, he got saved. Maybe he was a slave in the royal household. And then he rose to become a teacher and he started teaching uh, Domitian's niece, Flavia. Uh, again, so they are not ordinary people. They are quite people in high standing in Roman society in the first century. And, and that's what we can, we can find from here. And we don't know, you know, at the time when the letter to the Romans was written, whether these people had that position or... Um, they grow to this position afterwards. Yeah. So we don't know. It's, it's, it's really fascinating when you look at this. And I think, you know, this is sometimes the way God works, where, where he takes nobodies, and, and suddenly nobodies are in position of great influence, you know, somewhere in society. And, and he places them in, in areas where, um, uh, where it becomes quite amazing, you know, that, that the nobodies get elevated to high positions. And um, likewise, big people like Phoebe, you know, a wealthy, possibly powerful woman has chosen to just become humble and to be a helper to the saints and to wash the feet of the saint, saints. And even, you know, spent her money to deliver a letter to Rome, you know, go on, go on a ship and deliver the letter and, and get this all sorted and, and leave it in Rome. And, and obviously, we've got this letter today or a copy of this letter today. So it's... Um, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. There's a story behind every name you see in the book of Roman, Romans in chapter 16. And, and all we are doing here is just scratching the surface, really. But in the same way, you know, in every Christian's life, there's a story. And when you, when you look behind, you know, the power of God 
looking in the Christian's life, and and it can be nobodies up and down uh, the world, and these nobodies, you some suddenly find that they've got greatest influence, and that empires fall or stand on for the sake of those who are called, uh, who are called by by the Lord, and who are called according to His name, and who have been separated out, and uh, so it's it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And we are just talking, you know, a couple of decades after after the resurrection, when when all this happened. Okay, uh, we've got the next one. It's number nine. Number nine on the list is Urbanus. Urbanus, our helper in Christ. Again, Urbanus was a common name in Roman times in the first century. Um, we know that the name appeared on a list of um, imperial freedmen in 115 A.D. Again, uh, we don't know whether it's this Urbanus or somebody else. Um, the name means polite. Uh, we know that uh, um, from the church fathers that Urbanus was closely re related to the Apostle Andrew. And again, Andrew, he um, was very active in Turkey. He um, went around the coast of the Black Sea. He preached to the uh, Scythians, like the, the Russians, the Slavic people, and... Um, so that was sort of his sphere of influence, and he was in um, in Byzantium as well, uh, quite quite strong. So, again, uh, not much we know about Urbanus. We know there are lots of Urbanus. He might have been a freedman. Uh, we find his name on a on a list in 115 AD, but it might be somebody else as well. Uh, the name was quite common, um, and again, possibly a slave. Um, but but he was closely related to to Andrew, and and we find some information about Urbanus. Uh, Urbanus in correlation with uh, the Apostle Andrew. Stachus, yeah, this is an interesting guy as well, beloved of Paul, and uh, he was an apostle. And he was the second bishop of Byzantium, and he lived from 38, or he was a bishop from 38 to 54 AD. Um, he's closely connected to uh, Paul and Andrew, and he died in 54 AD. Yeah. His name mean, means spike or the ear of a corn. Uh, he's again on this magic list of uh, 70 disciples, which m I repeat it again. I don't believe that these are the real disciples who were with Jesus. Some of them, yes, but not all of them, which are on this, this list. It has been compiled by the Orthodox Church. I, I personally believe it's just a list of outstanding people in the first century and is some means to honor them and put them on the uh, the list of the 70. Okay, he was succeeded by Onesimus, and it's interesting as well, Onesimus was a, a runaway slave. You know? And uh, there's one letter dedicated to Onesimus, and um, yeah, uh, it's, I, I find it fascinating. And Onesimus ended up being uh, the bishop of, uh, of Byzantium, of Byzance, or Constantinople. Obviously, Constantinople wasn't, you know, became later Constantinople, but... But one of the biggest cities uh, there, but but obviously it's not bishop in the sense of today that there's a massive cathedral and there's a man who walks around in great pomp. He's just uh, the bishop of uh, the town and he uh, makes sure that all the churches are okay, that everything is going fine. Um, and and as I said, like in the first century, it was pretty much uh, a death a death verdict. It is said that uh, Stachus died peacefully in 54 A.D. Yeah, so that's. Um, what happened? Okay. Uh, just trying to think whether I got it right, but uh, I'm not sure. There was one guy, he went to Athens. Uh, is this the next one? Uh, is there a palace? I'm not sure whether I'm getting it wrong. There was one guy, and the the tradition says that he went to um, to Athens, and he uh, re was it Athens? I think it was Athens. He ridiculed the um, the pagans, and um, you know, or was it Ephesus? Anyway, we're going to see this in a minute. I think it's it's a different one. I'm mixing it up. Just forget it. Just assume that he died peacefully. Apelles approved in Christ. Um, uh, he was closely related again to the Apostle Andrew. There are quite a few of them who uh, who spent a lot of time with Andrew. Um, there's also a Gnostic thinker by the same name in the 2nd century, 
But again, the timing doesn't work out, so it's unlikely that uh, Apelles would be would be that one. So Paul wrote the letter quite early. And I guess I would say that all these people he wrote to, they would have been born just at the beginning beginning of the first century, maybe in the first couple of decades. And so it's unlikely that they would have any impact in the second century. So by that time, they would have been very old, like in their 90s or 100s. Anyway, uh, this Apelles uh, is later the Bishop of Smyrna or possibly Heraclea. And the name means called. So like the German or the English term appeal to appel. Uh, in German as well, appel, the appel. Yeah. So Apelles, so the called one. Um, again, that's all we know about him. But but we see that these people, you know, in the first century, in the first, um, you know, wave, they, they ended up in Rome for some reason. Paul is writing to them, he's greeting them, and, and many of them, they became um, leaders within the church. And, and obviously many of them had to pay with their lives for that as well. Next one is um, Aristobulus. Um, he's the grandson of Herod the Great, um, a big household, presumably. He was, and this is again, we don't know, you know, how real it is, but this would have all happened in the first century. He was supposed to be the the first bishop of Roman Britain. So the Romans went over there, and um, there was a, a part of it which was uh, under British control, not all of it. And again, we have got the magic lift, list of the seventy disciples. So he was one of them. Sometimes he's also referred to of. As Aristobulus of Britannia, people think that he was martyred in Wales. Uh, he's also linked to Andrew somehow. So uh, a lot of these people, they spend quite a bit of time to Andrew. And it's it's a pity as well because you don't hear much about, or at least I don't know much about what Andrew did and sort of his activities, what he wrote. And and again, it's uh, I'm pretty confident that the Bible is fairly precise and accurate, but when you look at other historical writings, so the Church Fathers, you, you're not quite sure how much, uh, how accurate th- they really are. Yeah? So how much tradition has flown into it over the years. He was um, the brother of the Apostle Barnabas, yeah, possibly, and he was of Cypriotic Jewish origin. But, but what we hear is that obviously there was something going on and there was a big household <coughs> in... Um, in Rome, which he had, and um, and at one stage later on, he must have said, "Right, that's it. I'm going on a mission to Britain." And he became uh, the bishop of the first bishop of Roman Britain. Herodian, kinsman of Paul, it's interesting as well. And and we come back to the uh, suggestion that um, that Paul was linked to the Herodian household somehow; that he was related to them. So some of his distinguished relatives have become Christians, and one of them was Herodian. We have seen some other um, relatives before as well, Priscilla and... and, um, um, Let's have a look. I I don't know the names. I should remember them. Um, Adronicus and Junius, and then Priscilla, Aquila as well. We don't know whether they were related to Paul, but there is um, a suggestion that... um, that there's a link between Herod the Great and Paul, and uh, that there, that 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 that, that there was some sort of link yeah, with them. That he was of royal or arist- aristocratic blood. That he wasn't just a um, an ordinary Pharisee, but that he was a Pharisee with um, with. Um, with a royal background, and and which might explain why he has Roman citizen, citizenship as well, why he was a Roman citizen. For for normal Jews, Roman citizenship was very hard to to get hold of. Uh, uh, again, it's an argument. I don't know whether that's true, um, and I want to say this with utmost respect. Only only God knows the real stories of all these people. All we do is we speculate a little bit, we dig for some information. That's what I'm doing here. I find some information. I present it to you. Some of it may be correct, some of it I may have missed it, it may not be correct. I know that each name, there's a story behind each name, and um, one day we will know, one day when we are with the Lord, we won't have any questions, and we will just know the stories of these these people. But I find it fascinating to dig a little bit and to 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 get possibly near to what these people were all about, what their story is. 
Okay, so we've got a kinsman, like a relative of Paul uh, in Rome, who presumably uh, was linked with the royal household. Okay, this is uh, uh, the flower the, uh, by, by, the, by the same name, but we've got a, a guy called Narcissus, yeah, and the household connected to him as well. So possibly a house church, which was um, there. Greetings to those of his household who are in the Lord. Again, um, some people say that Narcissus was linked to Andrew as well. So a lot of people, it's, it's interesting, and I, uh, when I was doing my research, they, they had some link to the Apostle Andrew. So there was also a Narcissus. Might be a different Narcissus, not, not just this guy, but uh, who Paul is addressing it to, but might be a different guy. Uh, it says here that there's some information that he was a favorite freedman of Claudius the Emperor. So the freedman is a slave that found freedom and um, might still be working for uh, Caesar, but he wasn't a slave, he was free. Um, and there's an interesting thing as well, it's a greeting to the household only. Yeah. So so again, there's, it's a little bit sort of written in mystery, so we know... There's a household of Narcissus, and there are those who are in the Lord. So there's some Christians in his household. It doesn't mean that Narcissus is a Christian, and it doesn't mean that the Narcissus who is linked to Andrew is the same guy um, who is addressed here uh, in, in the letter to the Romans, especially, or maybe, you know, has come to the Lord at some time later and um, started, uh, you know, linking up with Andrew, the Apostle Andrew. But... Um, Ah, interesting. We don't know. We don't know what the story is, whether they're both the same or whether they're different different people, um, because he's not addressed directly. So we don't know whether he's not a believer at this point when the letter is written. Or he might have been. We don't know. Again, a little mystery, and one day we will find out. Um, then we've got two ladies, and the suggestion is that both of them are sisters, and they are called Tryphena and Tryphosa, and that is number 15 and 16 of our 35 names. And they are commended uh, for their labor in the Lord. They assume to be uh, sisters. And then the names mean luxurious and delicate. And, and it might suggest maybe they come from a rich household and that they are ladies of social standing in Rome. Um, the, the, the lesson here probably is instead of pursuing luxury, uh, they are now laboring in the Lord. And we've got a merging of Jewish, pagan, uh, slave and master societies. Yeah. So, so this is a fascinating thing. Also with the 35 names, so we find everything. We find a lot of Jews, we find a lot of pagans or Gentile believers, we find slaves and masters, we find wealthy people and poor people, and they're all mixed together. Yeah. And many of them end up to be um, bishops and uh, doing some great stuff for the Lord, but uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, we've got another name as well. This is number 17, is Persis. And we don't know anything about Persis. Persis just means a lady from per Persia. She's uh, said that she's beloved and that she labored much in the Lord. So it was a common female name in the first century Rome. So a lot of people were called Pers Persis. And it is just saying it's a lady from Persia. Uh, Paul speaks of her labors in past tense. So it may be suggested that she is sick or unable to work at the, at the time when Paul is writing the letter but our past work is, is still acknowledged. And that is something as well. So whatever you do today, you know, the works you do for the Lord and the, the labors you do and the help you give is not forgotten, forgotten before the Lord. Yeah, it's not forgotten before the Lord. And it's, it's still when the day comes and you are weak and frail, um, your works will follow you. And this is what Paul is pretty much saying here. The next one is Rufus. This is number 18. And Rufus means chosen in the Lord. Um, and we, we find out about Rufus that his mother has been a mother to Paul too. Um, the, the tradition says that um, the father of Rufus was Simon of Cyrene and that his brother is called Alexander. Now, Simon of Cyrene was the guy who carried the cross of Christ when, when um, you know, at the crucifixion when Jesus broke down and uh, they found Simon of Cyrene and they told him to carry the cross. So he's mentioned in Mark 15. A uh, suggestion is that it could be Rufus of Thebes and later became Bishop of, of Thebes. So that's in the northern part of Greece. And um, he's also in the list of the 70 disciples. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, he could have been one of the disciples Jesus has sent out. And his father, Simon of Cyrene, I mean, a lot of disciples were, when it, were, were around when it came to the crucifixion. 
and uh, and that fits in. So this could have been really somebody who was sent out with uh, with the seventy to proclaim the kingdom of God. Um, so yeah, Rufus, uh, chosen in the Lord. And uh, and there's a link with uh, Simon of Cyrene. Uh, interesting. So they're all coming together. Then we've got a, a list of uh, four people. We've got Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobas, and Hermes. Uh, and, and they're all mentioned sort of in one go. Okay, we find out about these guys, and, and maybe at the time they're just young men, and uh, they're in Rome, they are getting together, building a church, and um, they all ended up for some reason, for one reason or another in Rome, maybe fleeing Christian persecution, you know, in Judea or elsewhere in the in the kingdom, and so they went to Rome. Now, um, interesting as well, so we found, find out that uh, Asyncritus is bishop of Hyrcania, I'm not sure where it is, Hyrcania, uh, geographically, but he was martyred, that's what we know about him. Phlegon is a bishop of Marathon, so that's in Greece, and he was martyred as well. Hamas is Bishop of Philippi, or later on becomes Phil B Philip of, uh, the Bishop of Philippi, and he has written a book called The Shepherd. Yeah. And that's a classic book, you know, first generation, apparently it's still around today. I haven't read it, but when I, when I found out about this, and I've seen, I've seen the book, Shepherd, yeah, The Shepherd, I'll, uh, I think I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to spend some time to just read it. It would be fascinating to uh, read a book from the guys in the first century, so they they will have seen the, the best and the worst, uh, you know, what, what was going on in, in Christianity. Patrobas, Bishop of Puteoli. Um, he is also on the list of the 70. I'm not sure where Puteoli is. Sounds Italian to me. Um, then we've got Hermes, Bishop of Dalmatia, also on the list of the 70. Yeah. So the, all these guys, I mean, they are in Rome. They are not addressed as bishop or anything like that. And obviously, they're not at the locality where they would be bishops at a later stage in their lives. But, but Paul mentions them and he greets them. And it's, it's fascinating as well. So if you are a young person today and you reach out for Christ, you know, God has got something great for you in store. And that this, you know, you might not be a bishop, but... Uh, but, but God has got a plan for you, and only you can fulfill the plan. And these guys, they end up, you know, in the book to the Romans, and we find out later that, that they've been used for great things. Okay, 24, 25, 26, and 27. So that, that seems to be a house church, and we have got Philologos. Uh, we know that he was from the imperial household. Then we've got Julia, and we, we're not sure. It looks like it was Julia was either the wife or the sister of Philologos. Then we've got Nerois, and uh, there was an inscription found with his name, and he was declared to be the emperor's servant. So, uh, so the suggestion may be that it is, um, you know, somewhere in Rome. They've got a house church. We've got Olympus as well, and um, um, Philologus was the name given by the master of the freedmen. Yeah. So we, we, we don't know. It sounds, there's a suggestion that, that these might be of Caesar's household, yeah? that they were quite high up in the, um, you know, in the echelons of power in Rome. But again, we don't know. We don't know for sure. Yeah? This is just a little bit of speculation and we find inscriptions, but bearing in mind Rome was a big place. I'm not sure how many people would have lived there, but we are probably looking at um, maybe not big by today's standards, but maybe 100,000 or more. Yeah? There were quite a lot of people living there. Okay, right. Now, uh, this is up to 27. So these are all people in Rome, and, um, and they are mentioned in, in the letter to Romans of um, um, letter to the Romans. Yeah. So they are, they are in Rome and they are greeted in Rome. Now they get some information about the people who are in Corinth, where the letter is written. And the first person we have is Timothy. Yeah. Timothy was in Corinth at the time. He was Paul's spiritual son. Um, there are two letters in the Bible addressed to him. So it's First Timothy and Second Timothy. Um, I, I'm not sure how correct this data is, but he was supposed to be born around 17 AD. His father was Greek. He was born to a Jewish mother called Eunice, and his grandmother, also Jewish, was called Louise. Both ladies came to faith on Paul's first missionary journey in AD 46. When Paul and Timothy met, he was um, 33 and Paul was 46 years old. Yeah. 
again, the suggestion is this is five years after, um, and, and that's what I read somewhere, and, and I can't validate those numbers, so I don't know how they came up with these numbers. But that they met five years later. So uh, Timothy became a Christian when he was 28, and then at 33 he joined Paul on his second missionary journey. And um, and and Paul had him circumcised as well. So at age 28, it's I'm sure it's not a pleasant experience. Uh, Timothy was martyred uh, in Ephesus at age 80 or 97. Yeah. So he was going around, and later on he became a, a, a bishop, and he. Um, um, he was involved in church till, till old age, and at age 80 and 97, he, he was martyred. So, uh, still old age, yeah. But, um, good old Timothy. Right, moving on. Lucius. <clears throat> um, again, a name I haven't heard. Some people believe that um, there was some suggestion that he might be um, sort of African, Africanish. Um, he was um, the bishop of Kenshria. Again, Kenshria is near; it's a, the port city near Corinth. Uh, he was thought to be a relative of Paul. Uh, another name was Lucius of Cyrene. Um, he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Paul. So that's again where there's some connections there. And um, and again, we've got this whole thing that that Paul was probably more than what he led on to be. So he was probably of some sort of aristocratic blood. Uh, he was known, he was quite a distinguished person, so he wasn't uh, a pleb or a plebeian, but he was um, more from the aristocracy, you know, from the upper class. Uh, turned Pharisee, turned Christian, turned Christian leader, turned martyr. Yeah? So this was Paul and Lucius, and Paul, they knew one another, and um, they probably had a common youth together, and Lucius became a Christian as well, so it's, it's great news. He was in Rome at the moment, in Rome. Again, we've got two more people. No, sorry, I, I get it wrong. He wasn't in Rome, he was in Corinth, because, uh, sorry, these people are, no, they are now with Paul, so they are sending their greetings to the people in Rome. Correction. So they were in Corinth at the time. So we've got Jason and Sosipata. Um, so there's Jason of Thessaloniki, and uh, they reckon that he was Bishop of Tarsus, so that's uh, somewhere in Turkey. Uh, both of them are reaching out to the Gentiles. They were Jewish Christian believers. Uh, they gave refuge to Paul. That's what we find. And, and um, they were imprisoned in Corfu while on mission. So they, both of them went to Corfu, and um, the, um, the king became a little bit upset with them because a lot of people came to Christ, so they put him in prison. Then a lot of prisoners uh, became, um, became Christians. And when they were executed... The daughter of the king saw how they died, and that turned her, made her to become a Christian. So the king put his daughter in prison, hoping that she would reconsider, but she would not deny the name of Christ. She would stick to Christ. And um, and then um, I think he executed his daughter, if, if I'm right. Um, then uh, there were Christians. I'm not sure what the, the king embraced Christianity. Okay, there were <clears throat> there were Christians either coming or leaving Corfu, and and he went on a ship to try and pursue them to kill them, um, but he died whilst he was persecuting Christians. Yeah. So a new king came to power in Corfu. He embraced Christianity, and uh, Jason and Sosopata were free to preach the gospel on Corfu for the rest of their life. And this church there is the church of Jason and Jason and Sosipata, and apparently there's a gate somewhere, and they are buried to the right and to the left hand side of this gate of this church. I'm not sure whether it's the um, let me just have the mouse here. It's this front gate here of the church, or, or where it is. But it's uh, again, it's it's really interesting to see you know the story these people have. So they they are bishops of certain places like Thessal Thessal Thessaloniki and Tarsus. Yeah. They both get together, they go to call for a missionary journey. But bearing in mind, you know, when bishop in a church doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you are rich and you get like nice clothes and uh, a house or whatever. It just means you're a church leader and it means you are the first one in the line to be, be persecuted. Yeah, so it's a very, very different to what it is today. And, and anyway, they both ended up in Corfu and um, they, they reached out to the people of Corfu. And, uh, and that's their church probably a church they built or maybe a place or a house they were buried, bearing in mind 
churches didn't come into existence until a, a long time later. Christians were just meeting wherever, wherever they could, in people's homes, under under a tree, somewhere near the river, wherever, wherever they could meet. Tertius, okay, Tertius again. He is in. Um, Yeah, at the time, obviously, at the time when all this is happening there with Paul in Corinth, yeah, Tertius is a scribe for Paul, so um, he has written the Epistle to the Romans, and that's pretty much all we know. Now, when you get these uh, names like Tertius, in and in a moment we get the name Quartus, it means the third one. And very often these people were slaves, and uh, sometimes they were slaves at um, you know noble households. And they would have like, uh, you know, first slave, second slave, third slave, fourth slave, uh, fifth slave, and so, and so on. So Tertius might have been the third slave or something. But, but we don't know. Yeah? This is all speculation. All we know is that this is a guy who has written the epistle for Paul, and that he was Paul's scribe. Um, there's a suggestion in the Bible that Paul was um, struggled with his eyesight and that maybe he couldn't write very well anymore because... Um, his, his eyesight was was too weak. Uh, Gaius, um, host of the to the company, most likely consisting uh, of Paul, Timothy, Tertius, Jason, Sosipata, and a few others, um, Quartus as well. Um, so he was hosting everybody. So he had maybe a big home, and everybody was living there. It sounds like he was a wealthy man, and he was able to host the whole group. Um, it looks like he was accommodating a house church. Um, Paul baptized him in Corinth. That's what we know about Gaius. And it was quite a common name in the first century. So a lot of people were called Gaius. But, uh, but there certainly is a relationship. And, and Paul was staying with him. And uh, there are probably all this stuff going on. So it's an interesting situation. Uh, we've got Erastus, number 34. And Erastus uh, was a steward of the city of Corinth. He was a city official. Probably high-ranking as well. And... Um, um, it seems that he, have, that he has traveled with Paul at one stage. He's mentioned in Acts 19 and in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. And, and we found an in inscription in Corinth, uh, Erastus, Commissioner of Public Works. It's interesting. So I have to say one thing. Um, um, when you go back into the early Roman days, and especially in Greek society, uh, there were slaves were quite normal at one stage i mean they thought that pretty much all of the roman society was run by slaves and there were very few people sitting on top of the slaves who were enjoying the fruit of the labors of their slaves but there were there were lots of them there so it was quite normal to have a slave or to be a slave yeah which is obviously is not very nice and they pretty much had no rights and uh, weren't free to do what they wanted. But the, there was one interesting category, and that was you could be the slave of the city. So you could be a city official. And, um, and that means the city owned you, and you were in service to the city, but the remuneration was very good. Um, they very often were treated better than free people who were working for the city. So they had a better income, better everything. It's a bit like uh, um, um, they, they couldn't be sacked. They were looked after, um, and and it was quite a distinguished position. Even though it, it, to us it sounds very strange, you know, how can you be a slave of you know London or whatever, and um, <clears throat> then do your service for the for the for the city or for the town? But uh, we even have got a, an, an inscription from, and they found it some time ago, um, and they know that this is from the first century. So, uh, might be um, might be our Erastus from uh, Romans chapter sixteen, uh, and the guy took some time out, and he was in a position to do so to assist Paul on his journey. And here we've got the last one, and we are still within one hour, which is great. So. Uh, we don't have to split this talk in, in two, in two uh, sections. And uh, this is Quartus. This is the one uh, which I was confusing with the other one. Anyway, this is Quartus. Quartus was born in Athens, and he was also known as Quartus Beritus, and probably because he later was bishop of Beirut, so Beritus, Beirut. He's also numbered among the seventy. Um, Quartus suggests that he might have been a slave at one time, but uh, the information I got that he was a wealthy and learned nobleman with the name Quartus. 
uh, allegedly visited many countries to preach the gospel and then um, eventually returned to Athens where people stoned him, burned him to death. So he was preaching the gospel and ridiculing the, gent the gen Gentiles of uh, worshipping their pagan gods. And uh, as a result, he was stoned and uh, he was then pushed into a fire to, to be burned to death. And these are the 35 names. I think that's the last slide. Let's have a look. Yeah, the, the last slide. Let's have a quick look through, uh, through our names. Um, we've got Phoebe, you know, the, the letter carrier, most likely. Um, then we've got um, Priscilla and Aquila, tent makers. Paul was making tents. He was, uh, I think... I think it was once he was in Corinth as well. He was making, um, you know, working for himself, earning his own living. Um, those two were off to Rome. Paul was still in Corinth. Epinetus, um, you know, first convert in Asia, originally from Ephesus, later became bishop of Carthage. And, and again, when you look at the Roman Empire, Ephesus is in Turkey, Carthage is in North Africa. Um, there was an inscription found in Rome, Ep Epinetus, an Ephesian, yeah, maybe relating to him, we don't know. Uh, we've got Mary, we don't know which Mary it is. Again, Mary was uh, a name which was, uh, I wouldn't say common, but was often used. There are a lot of Marys in the first century, even today. And uh, and again, her, her labors have not been forgotten. We've got Adronicus and Junius, uh, Paul's relatives, who also went to prison with them. Um, certainly notable people. We've got Amplias, the beloved in the Lord. And uh, and again, whoever Amplias was, but it looks like um, from this statement that he, he was buried in a, in a very lavish and expensive grave, that he was linked with Flavia, the nie niece of uh, Caesar Domitian, and, um, and he was a teacher. Uh, so uh, interesting, interesting. Urbanus, a helper. Then we've got Stachus, uh, became the second bishop of Byzantium. Apelles, um, bishop of Smyrna or Heraclea, we're not quite sure about this. Uh, Aristobulus, um, first bishop of Roman Britain. So we've got people who ended up in Britain. So he's in Rome right now, he's got a big household and eventually ends up in Britain preaching the gospel. Herodian, you know, the royal household and kinsman of Paul, suggesting that Paul was of royal blood. Uh, Narcissus, again, we don't know whether he's the guy Andrew was linked with, but uh, there was a household, and in his household were a lot of Christians, so greetings went to them. And maybe Narcissus, at one stage, became a Christian too, and he hooked up with Andrew, and... Uh, Somehow he was working with him. We've got Trafina and Trafosa, the sisters in the Lord. Not in the Lord, but the sisters who labored in the Lord. Um, probably, you know, rich upper society Roman ladies who uh, have chosen to serve the Lord rather than to live in luxury. Uh, Persis, no idea who she is, um, but... A woman who has done a lot in the Lord, but was probably, because Paul uses past tense, no longer in a position to labor, and Paul has remembered her. Rufus, uh, um, right there, the link with Mark 15, you know, Simon of Cyrene, his son, is now in, uh, in Rome, and uh, later he's a bishop of Thebes in, in Greece, and Paul is greeting him. Uh, then we've got all the like the, <laughs> the list of bishops, um, the five people: Asynchronous, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobas, and Hermes. One of them has written a book, The Shepherd. Um, then we've got Philologos, Julia, Neros, and Olympus, a house church people. And then we've got the people, obviously, from Corinth, uh, starting with Timothy, Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater. Later in Corfu and reaching out with the gospel in Corfu, where they later died. Tertius, the scribe for Paul, Gaius, you know, the, um, the host who's hosting everybody. And then we've got Erastus, and right at the end, um, the steward of the city of Corinth, you know, a high-ranking city official. And then we've got Quartus as well, who later became bishop of Beirut. Probably at the time when they were written to, they were, um, they were fairly insignificant people. They were just known by Paul, but they all had a common vision. 
They wanted to move the gospel and they wanted to move it to the ends of the world. And they succeeded. They pretty much succeeded in their mission to move the gospel to the ends of the world. So it's just um, a great a great time, a great um, great to hear that these people are mentioned and immortalized in uh, Romans 16. And I, I just want to finish on this note that your name, if you are in Jesus Christ, God has got a calling on your life. And I want to encourage you to, to pursue your calling and to do to the best of your ability what God has given you and what God wants you to do. And I can assure you that your name is written in the book of life. Yeah, if you are with the Lord, that's, that's a great news and that's a great promise we have in the Bible. But also that, that, um, that there will be a record of what you have done, uh, the good things. I'm sure all of, all of these names you've got, they've all made terrible mistakes in their lives. They've, they've screwed up many times. Um, let me, let me use another term to screw it up. Screwed up in English means, in uh, English, English means, they made big mistakes. They messed up, I think this is another term. They made mistakes. Yeah. And we all make mistakes. They've made mistakes, but still God has uh, called them out. Many of them have become bishops. Many of them have um, been just immortalized. Some of them, they've been mentioned. We don't know who they are, but one day when you go to heaven, for example, Persis or Mary, we don't really know who these two women were. But you will meet them, and, and they will have a story to tell, and they will tell you what they did for the Lord. And, uh, and we can do things for the Lord as well. Whatever you find within your power to do, whatever you find God is calling you to do, whatever you find that, um, you know, that the Holy Spirit is just sort of nudging you and pushing you in a certain direction, go for it with all your heart and do the right thing. Don't, don't relent. Don't grow weary. Don't grow tired. And, and, and I'm saying this. I'm getting tired all the time. I know sometimes... I should be doing stuff and uh, I'm just tired and I let it go and I do it later and it's not good. I should do it when, when I've got the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do it. It's very, very important. So let me pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for these 35 names which are mentioned in, uh, in Romans 16. I pray, Lord, that uh, the knowledge about Romans 16 will increase and the documents and evidence will come forth, you know, telling us and confirming what your word says about these these people. Same as with, um, uh, what's his name? Is it Erastus? With Erastus of Corinth, like, that suddenly researchers and archaeologists find his name on a, on a first century plaque and, um, and are confirming what your word says. I want to thank you for that. I pray help us to follow the calling you have placed upon our lives and not to grow weary or lax or tired in doing so and uh, to seek you first with all of our hearts, minds, and soul. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that was about an hour. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, God bless. I hope you enjoyed this little journey of the 35 names and Romans 16. And uh, I, I, let me assure you, Romans 16 is not finished. Um, there will be many more names, many more names. Uh, and, and one day they'll all be pronounced. And what you have done and... The, uh, the good things you have done in the Lord will all be known and will be, will be made known to everyone. God bless you and bye-bye. From Michael here at Seismic Radio at BPN Radio.